My name is Travis Spencer. I'm the CEO of Tubo Technologies. We are a systems integrator specializing in creating secure APIs and helping organizations actually uh, launch these. And, and so what I want to talk to you about today is actually how to transform into a platform. We, we've heard some uh, discussions about this, and we're going to uh, share our views on, on this as well. So the agenda that we'll go through today is to first of all talk about some of these disruptive trends uh, that are affecting our societies, that are affecting our businesses, and uh, kind of put the, the broader context in place, and then talk about how we can overcome uh, those disruptive trends and take advantage of them by opening up uh, our organizations, our data, as open API platforms, and talk about some of the reasons and the rationale for launching an API, and then want to give you some examples. And finally, I want to talk about where to start and actually give you some, some practical advice and guidance on how you can uh, put together an API platform uh, that meets your requirements. So when we kind of step back from all of the tech, all of the APIs, if we just look at uh, our world today, we can see that it's becoming much more social, it's becoming much more mobile, uh, it's becoming a lot cloudier, there's uh, resulting in lots and lots of data, and this is having a profound effect on, on our personal lives, on our business lives, uh, at the, both the, the micro level and at the macro level. I'm sure you can all think of examples from your own life uh, some from my mine, uh, like my little nephew, for example, he uh, went skiing last year and um, during sports week, and he brought two tablets. Uh, he had to have uh, games on on one and uh, some of the games on another, so he brought both. and And that that week at uh, at the camp, there were fourteen uh, tablets in a in a little stuga of uh, twenty one people. And I'm curious, in, in a couple more weeks, uh, when they go back up again, how many will it be this time? Will it be 30? Uh, I'm wondering. Um, so we're becoming much more mobile at the, the, the micro level. We're becoming much more social at that level, uh, but also at the business level. Uh, at the, in our workplaces, uh, we're coming in and we're bringing our own devices. Uh, we're wanting to have that same experience in our workplaces as we're having in our, in our personal lives, that interconnectedness. And these are really restructuring the way that, that organizations are having to uh, address their workforce, are having to uh, address their, their staff and their partners. And so this, the, the consequences for the business is that these four megatrends will really be driving IT for the next decade. Uh, the, for the next decade, we'll have new programs, we'll have new strategies, we'll have new um, uh, programs, and all of these are at the back of it. I've strongly believe driven by either social, mobile, uh, cloud, or big data, and the adopters of of these four technologies, these four mega trends, these will become the market leaders in a decade. What's happening, I believe, is almost uh, like the the this massive shift of power away from those who don't adopt these technologies that are in power today to those who do adopt these. So there's a real opportunity here. It's, it's an immense chance. And as Andreas was talking about in the, in the first talk, you know, small startups with just a few people now through the use of APIs can do things that were formerly only possible by very large organizations with very large budgets to buy uh, large servers and computers and compute power. And that's no longer the case. So the consequence for business is that they, they need to become more open. They need to open up data to their partners. They need to open up data to their subsidiaries. They need to open up data to the public uh, so that they can do things to, to cope with those changing expectations and to become more mobile, to become more cloudy. And while this is all really interesting and while this is all really cool, while this is all really fun, uh, it's not practical and it's not possible to just throw away all of the technology investments that have been made, all the infrastructure that's working, uh, the CFO, the control that they wouldn't allow such a thing anyway. Uh, those investments are being depreciated on the books for the next 10 years. We have to get a return on that investment, but we also can't ignore what's going on in, in, in the changing world. It's almost like 
this, this big glacier coming down the mountain, splitting this fjord through the land. And, and on the one side, we have those who are adopting, and on the other side, we have those who don't adopt. And just because we've made investments in technology that we need to get a return on it is not an excuse to, to not adopt and to not get on the right side of the fjord. Otherwise, that opportunity, that power, that money uh, will, will be going to those who do. So we want to find a way to actually um, take advantage of the existing technology, take advantage of the existing capabilities, but use them in this new world that we find ourselves in. And the way to do this is by becoming an API platform, by launching a base on which you can do business in this more agile world that we are finding ourselves in now. So IT organizations need to find a way of bridging that old world into this new world. I talked a little bit in the setup about what an API is. Uh, we had the, a two-day conference in September, and uh, I was talking with someone who was there the entire time, and, and afterward uh, they, they said it wasn't until they, they, they thought of an API as a backend for a mobile app that it really clicked what an API was. So there's all sorts of different ways to describe it, uh, but as, we, as I said before, it, it's a contract. It's a, it's, a, it's a guarantee. It's a promise of if you, if you communicate with my software in this way, I'll respond in this manner. Um, just like a mobile application that, that you write, you publish into the App Store, I, I make a promise to that app that if you call my, my back end in this way, you're going to get the data that you can present in that application in that manner. So it's, it's like a contract. It's also like a book. As I mentioned, there's all sorts of information in various books where the, the authors are not uh, thinking about what we could do with those books. Uh, our teachers didn't, didn't have any preconceived notions of what we were going to do with the mathematics and the literature that they taught us. But by learning all of that information, we can put it together now in all sorts of new and innovative ways that they never imagined and never conceived of. In the same way, an API publisher is putting all this data, all these capabilities out there that we can go and pull them together and combine in, in new and innovative ways that they themselves didn't think of, that they themselves weren't interested in, that, that might have been beyond them. So think about APIs as a contract. Think of APIs as a back end for a mobile app. Think of APIs as books in a library. However you think about them, the result is that more and more of these APIs are existing. Um, as was mentioned before, Programmable Web is a directory where these APIs are being cataloged. And uh, at the moment, there's, there's 10,000 plus being cataloged. And every time I give this presentation, I got to go back up and update that number because it, it really is this, this huge uptake uh, that's happening. And well, the reason for this uptake uh, is that, that that device explosion, that, that mobile applications uh, are ne necessitating uh, access to data. So in order for, for mobile applications who are uh, more and more becoming available to get access to data, uh, they need to have an API. And what's happening is not only the mobility part, but the corporate access to data. So more and more enterprises now are trying to use mobile applications uh, they're trying to connect with subsidiaries and partners, uh, and all of this interconnectedness uh, requires APIs. So as corporations are now starting to launch uh, more and more APIs, more and more mobility is going on. This has resulted in this exponential growth uh, of the cataloged APIs. And as uh, Mark was saying, you know, the, the, the underlying uh, tip of that iceberg uh, is even more than what we have cataloged. Uh, in programmable web. So there, the uptake is massive, and the platformification effect of all of these organizations to cope with this more mobile, cloudy social world is uh, the, more and more APIs. And if we, we look at APIs, like they are creating and unlocking uh, all of this new business value. So uh, as uh, Eve Mailer from Forrester said, APIs can create and unlock the value of business data. And they can do this in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we've touched on some today, uh, but other examples are things like customer acquisition and retention, uh, things like innovation, being able to uh, tap into other people who are, are maybe more innovative uh, than uh, yourselves because maybe you have the data, but you're not as innovative, or vice versa, uh, getting access to that data and you're extremely innovative and moving fast and creating great presentation layers on top of that data. So that, that combination uh, is what's helping to unlock the value uh, of this business data. 
And because APIs are computer programs at their heart, they, they create more efficiencies, more uh, automation. So we're able to automate new systems, new procedures that have been um, manual beforehand or only partially automated. But as we build and launch more and more APIs, all of these procedures and processes become uh, more automated, more automatic, uh, more and making us more efficient, which is also kind of tying in with what Andreas was saying of that, that disruptive fact of APIs is from their, the changing expectation. If we can get things now because they're automated, uh, we're going to expect that, you know, why can't I do this on my phone? Why can't I have this quickly? Why can't I just turn around and, and, and use this data today? So APIs are really unlocking uh, that business value. And APIs aren't interesting in and of themselves. We talked uh, a little bit uh, before about how uh, when uh, Instagram was purchased by Facebook, they turned off the API for Twitter. And people were outraged by that because they couldn't use Instagram in that way. They didn't know they were saying that they wanted API access to be turned back on, but that is what they were saying. So that kind of just shows the, the point that uh, APIs themselves aren't interesting. You're not going to hear your customer saying, perhaps you're not going to hear your customer saying, I want an API for that. You're going to say, they're going to say things like, I want reduced friction, or we need a faster process, or uh, we need better integration, or we need a, a mobile application for this. These sort of things is what they're saying, just like uh, the, the Instagram user said, I want to be sharing this on Twitter. So we need to, through education and knowing what APIs are, connect those dots and say, aha, that's, that's where we need an API. And in order to, to do that, uh, we're going to need an API platform. We need an API strategy. We're going to need to have a cohesive and conscious thought about how we should be putting uh, this data out there or consuming this data from other parties so that it doesn't negatively affect, affect our business. Um, and really what's going to happen is as more and more organizations launch data in this way through APIs that, uh, like Mark was talking about, products in the future are going to come from uh, platformified companies. So the APIs will be the products uh, or enable the sale of other products through indirect business. We've talked about some examples like uh, Amazon and Netflix. Uh, I want to give you one of my favorite examples, which is a company called Pearson. They are a publishing company who have put out many, many books uh, on all sorts of uh, topics around travel uh, and other things. But uh, what, what they had was a lot of data. They had a lot of interesting facts about where you could go in Stockholm if you were traveling, or where you, sites you could see in Paris, or things to look at uh, in, in Belgium if you're there, and statues and museums and pricing of tickets and all of this sort of great information that they would publish in their books that they had to create in order to publish those books, almost like, um, uh, like to compare it to more of a, uh, a traditional industry like uh, manufacturing. They would, they would manufacture moldings, for example, and the offput of that would be sawdust. They, had, they were producing books. The offput of that was data. So, so it, it, at the beginning of, of a manufacturer's business, they might have paid to have that sawdust removed uh, as waste. Um, then along comes some entrepreneur and says, hey, I can glue that sawdust together and make a new product. Uh, in the same way, Pearson recognized that the offput of, of their processes, that data, could be used in new products uh, by bringing it together, maybe with some social data, maybe with some information from uh, taxi services or um, transportation providers like S-Cell. Um, putting that together into a new product. Uh, and the result of that uh, was that they could, they could leverage this existing sunk cost uh, to create an entirely new revenue stream. And so what they did is, uh, first of all, they just launched a single API. Uh, very good success, very good uptake, started to build their developer community, uh, launched new APIs, and started to uh, build a, a platform on which they could do more and more, launch more and more APIs. Uh, and the result then is that that sawdust, that sunk cost, becomes an entirely new revenue stream uh, through the innovation uh, of an entrepreneur who could, who could use that byproduct in that fashion. So great example, really love that. Um, lots of other examples, uh, such as, as Salesforce. Uh, they provide platform as a service, so you can, you can go there and get sort of a, um, a base on which you can do your business, uh, helping 
200,000 customers and, and partners to use their applications. Um, and what's interesting about Salesforce is it spans all industries. So it doesn't matter if it's uh, banking, it doesn't matter if it's uh, education, government, it's like every, every vertical uh, somewhere in the world is using Salesforce. So they've kind of uh, span this, uh, all of those, uh, and are providing applications and, and services and the ability to run new applications on top of their platform. So what's really interesting about Salesforce is it attracts new customers by giving them lower costs uh, and also giving them increased performance. So you don't have to go and set up everything from scratch and figure all that out. You can just very quickly get started by building on top of, of their base, lowering your costs, lowering uh, your time to market, uh, and making it uh, much more efficient and, and quick for you to uh, try out a, a new business opportunity, a new business idea, uh, and to outsource that, that capability to uh, the platform. What's also interesting about Salesforce example is that 60% of all of their, their traffic is not through their website, it's not through salesforce.com, but through api.salesforce.com. So it's actually coming through the API, through the different mobile apps uh, that they themselves have launched and uh, mobile apps of their partners, uh, through web server traffic and uh, connected systems. So all of that, the, the, the the base on which they're building is predominantly being used more and more by APIs, uh, API clients. Uh, other examples that we haven't talked about so far today might be someone like Spotify, who uh, has a, an open platform on which you can uh, figure out all sorts of, um, find new music and, and begin leveraging that music. Um, and even just over a weekend, uh, a couple of sharp friends of mine got together and, and put together a, a new application that they can now start distributing uh, in the Spotify app store. And it didn't take them having to go and get licenses to all those different uh, musicians' uh, content. They could just leverage the, the base on which uh, Spotify provided them, launch an application, uh, and, and put it out there to people. Uh, really exciting opportunities that didn't exist a few years ago. Uh, what's also interesting about the Spotify case is that they're building on top of Amazon, also like Netflix, building on top of Amazon's platform for innovation. So it's like this layering on effect where uh, the infrastructure providers like Amazon are creating a platform for companies like Salesforce, um, where other companies like um, uh, Netflix or Spotify can launch their systems and then other developers can create all sorts of interesting uh, capabilities on top of all, all those layers. And, and the layering of APIs is almost similar uh, to the layering of cloud service providers where you have infrastructure as a service, I, I, uh, IaaS um, platform as a service, which I mentioned here on the Salesforce case, uh, and software as a service. So it's almost like the, the SaaS providers uh, that we were talking about so much just two, three years ago are, are now kind of they, they must also become API providers. Uh, and as they're launching their SaaS applications, more and more of them are architecting it in a way that they build the API first, and then they build the web-based uh, SaaS application on top of that so that they can also uh, provide uh, or quickly build a mobile application, or they can have a third party uh, build that, that mobile application or even the, the web application on top of that. So a lot of uh, interesting opportunities, a lot of uh, change that's going on because of these four massively disrupting trends of social, mobile, cloud, and big data. Um, lots of people who've gone before us. Uh, we're not early adopters anymore. We have great examples like Salesforce and Spotify and, um, and others. So how do we get started? How do we actually follow in their footsteps and begin doing this? And one of the things that, that we've seen in helping our customers is that at, at sort of the, the middle of all four of those trends is knowing who someone is. One of the, the, the big incumbents or the, the, the difficulties in integrating all of these different systems, from whether they're social or cloudy or, or mobile, uh, is figuring out who somebody is. If, if you can take that out of the equation, it makes it so much easier to integrate all of this data. If you can reliably and, cons and securely know 
who the person is that's speaking to your API, you can make a decision about what they should be allowed to do, what data should they be allowed to consume. So the identity is right there in the middle of that. And what's really exciting in, in our opinion is that we have solutions for this. Uh, as I mentioned, we're not early adopters anymore. The technology is there. We had at the beginning of the API uh, revolution, the, a lot of data that was being produced was very low value data. A lot of it was being used by social networks and in, in sort of uh, those sort of use cases. And as I told you before, what's causing that immense uh, uptake in APIs is enterprises now starting to adopt it. And what, what is very important to a lot of enterprises is that the information and the data that they uh, open up through their APIs is secured. So we have people who have adopted this. We have technologies that we can use uh, to secure that. And, and what we want to do with those technologies is provide these four, uh, or five rather, capabilities which we put together into something we call the Neo Security Stack. And this Neo Security Stack together with APIs gives us things like federation, provisioning, uh, identity, delegated access, uh, and authorization. And these are very important things to think about uh, as you're launching your API because without considering those, you could actually have a detrimental effect to your business by exposing it to unnecessary risk, by uh, resulting in a breach by the data being lost or uh, slipping into the hands of a competitor. And the, the technologies that make up this stack uh, are things like SAML for federation and OpenID Connect. For provisioning, we have something called SKIM, which is, stands for System for Cross-Domain Identity Management. And for identity, we have the JSON Identity Suite. And for uh, delegated access, we have OAuth. And for authorization, we have Zacamole. And what's probably most uh, important about these five technologies is A, they're, they are defined by international standards bodies. B, they're adopted in the industry uh, by others who have launched uh, APIs already. Um, and they're proven and they're secure. So how we use them is very important though uh, for that security to, to uh, manifest itself. So what we talk about when we help our, our customers build API platforms is to structure this Neo security stack uh, on top of, uh, and to build three pillars on top of that, uh, which we call the identity management system, the API management system, and the entitlement management system. And this together allows us to launch uh, Neo a Neo security platform that we can do business more quickly, more agilely on without opening ourselves up to unnecessary risks by launching an API and at the end, uh, know who is consuming that information and make a proper decision on whether or not we should actually expose it. So really what happens with this Neo security platform is that the security becomes an enabler. It's actually not holding back, it's not standing in the way of the organizations adopting cloud, adopting mobile, adopting social. It just provides the technical means to do so uh, in a way that we're balancing the risk, we're balancing the potential exposure uh, together with the benefit of launching these APIs. So maintaining that, that control to the point that we need to maintain it uh, and, and then creating uh, these more connected systems where we have all sorts of clouds, we have all sorts of uh, directories and databases that are going to connect to these various cloud services, these various APIs. If we can take that, the question of who you are out of the mix, if we, can, if we can answer that through the identity management system, working together uh, with these other components of the Neo security platform, we can comfortably and safely open them up as APIs. And really what we, that is so important as we, we cope with and we begin adopting cloud, mobile, social, and big data. So with that, I'll leave it, unless there are some questions that I can answer. All right, well, thanks for listening, and uh, grab me during a break if you'd like to discuss more.